for way too long, so-called legacy automakers have dragged the collective metaphorical feet when it comes to making electric vehicles, and historically, we've seen little in the way of serious attempts to make affordable, capable plug-in vehicles from most of the world's car brands. This year, however, that has changed. We've seen automaker after automaker line up to offer their future vision for the electric car, with General Motors, Ford, Volkswagen, Volvo, and Renault all holding special investor days or media events at which they have collectively laid out their strategy for the future of all electric and electrified vehicles. Now we have a new one to add to the list, Stellantis, which held its own electric vehicle day last week while the team were all on a little break. So today I'm going to go over what we learned from the company's automotive presentation, as well as explain why it's a big deal that Stellantis's North American brands, including Dodge and Jeep, are getting plugs. First though, a little bit of background, because you may not recognize Stellantis. And that's okay, because Stellantis hasn't been around as a brand for all that long. Formed when the European car group PSA merged with Fiat Chrysler earlier this year, Stellantis is now the sixth largest automaker in the world by volume, and includes a long list of well-known brands, including Bath, Alfa Romeo, Citroen, Dodge, DS, Fiat, Fiat Professional, Jeep, Lancia, Maserati, Mopar, Peugeot, Ram, Opel, and Vauxhall. And yes, those last two, which were once owned by General Motors, were sold to PSA in 2017, and is actually the reason why the new Peugeot 208 Electric and Opel or Vauxhall e Corsa share the same underpinnings, and also partly why you can't easily get your hands on an Opel e Ampera anymore. Based in the Netherlands, Stellantis was formed with a 50-50 merger between Fiat Chrysler and PSA, and combined, now is responsible for 58 different production facilities around the world. During the multi-hour presentation streamed online and visible from Stellantis's own web portal for the event, the company laid out its commitment to electrifying its lineup with a total of 35 and a half billion US dollars earmarked to be spent before the end of 2025 to bring all of its brands into a new electric age. At the heart, a pledge to make 70% of Stellantis's sales in Europe and 40% of its sales in the US with a plug by the middle of this decade. And while many of Stellantis's European brands are already well on their way to a comprehensive electric portfolio, company CEO Carlos Tavares said that the traditional all-American brands like Dodge, Ram and Jeep aren't going to be left behind. He said, quote, Stellantis is now in full execution mode at full speed on its electrification journey. Five months after its birth, powered by its diversity of people and brands, Stellantis accelerates to lead the way the world moves." End quote. Like so many of the other events we've seen this year, Tavares talked about the adoption of a vertical integration policy within all of Stellantis's brands, paring down technological developments to form four brand new platforms that would be shared across a wide variety of vehicles and vehicle classes, providing power for all of those new cars, five new gigacapacity battery facilities capable of producing a total of 260 gigawatt hours of cell production every year, exclusively for the family. I'll come back to the specifics of the battery technologies in a second, but I think it's worth taking some time here to note the terminology of Gigafactory, because some of you have commented in previous videos that you feel legacy automakers are stealing Tesla's Gigafactory term. But the reality is subtly different. Gigafactory, at least when it comes to battery production, refers to a production facility that can make more than one gigawatt hours of battery cells per year. Since every major automaker is seeking to, frankly, play catch up with Tesla and build electric cars, as well as perhaps first catch up to a handful of rival automakers who are already producing their own cells in-house, Multiple cell production facilities capable of each producing more than a gigawatt hour of cells per year are required for every single company, hence the term gigafactories. 
I hope that's cleared things up a bit. Unlike most presentations we've seen from mainstream automakers to date, Stellantis chose to showcase a video made up of sound bites from existing electric vehicle customers, including Opel e Corsa and Fiat 500e owners, commercial electric vehicle partners like DHL, as well as Jeep customers who were discussing the future of the Jeep brand as an all-electric off-roader. Interestingly too, Solantis chose to discuss some of the challenges facing electric vehicles today, namely range anxiety and charging concerns of early adopters, and I think that's a valid and refreshing angle to take. Rather than pretend that everything thus far has been peachy wonderful, Stellantis chose to make the feedback the starting point for laying out its future plans. For example, it said that 80% of current EV offerings will fit customers in the small customer segment, 90% of compact and mid-side cars can be displaced by electric vehicles, and 100% of light commercial vehicles' use cases could be met with electric. And just to be clear, LCV is a European term referring to mid-size and smaller delivery vehicles, like the Fiat Ducato, which is known in the US as the Ram Promaster. Interestingly though, after initial discussions, Stellantis' presentation turned to independent brands within the group, asking each to prevent their own electrification strategies. Opel, for example, went with the phrase, quote, from cold to cool, to showcase its electric vehicle journey, something which amusingly did include its past GM-derived Opel Ampera and Opel Ampera E. As a brand, Opel offers nine electrified models today and says it will introduce its first electric fuel cell fleet vehicle by the end of this year. Yes, unlike some automakers, Stellantis appears to be looking at both battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell electric. Opel, as a brand, says it will offer every one of its vehicles as an electric model by 2024, ditching internal combustion engines in Europe entirely by 2028, which is, what, seven years from now? Keeping in line with other automakers who have reimagined classic badges from the past as all-electric models, Opel also committed to the rebirth of the Manta as the Manta E. No, it won't be the one-off resto mod that we've seen in recent months and all want, but instead seems to be some kind of crossover. Surprise, surprise. Alongside going electric in Europe, Opel says it will enter into the Chinese market as a solely electric brand, stating, quote, green is the new cool. Halfway around the world from Opel and its mainstream offerings, Stellantis highlighted Dodge Next, which gave a presentation highlighting the brand's history of muscle cars and out-and-out -out horsepower, a brand which, until very recently, wouldn't be seen dead highlighting any electric options. Dodge is going electric, though, with what it claims will be the world's first all-electric muscle car, due to launch in 2024. Stating that it will embrace electric drivetrains as a matter of evolution, Dodge played an advert that highlighted its out-and-out V8 muscle cars and then asked, quote, Why on God's green earth would Dodge ever build an electric car? With plenty of head shakes and blank stares. But, according to the brand, quote, Performance made us do it. Yeah, performance and a Tesla Model S Plaid and Porsche Taycan Turbo S and a Ford Mustang Mark E GT, I'd wager. Welcome to the party, guys. Glad you could finally join us. The individual presentations from various brands continued, with Peugeot highlighting how it has been at the forefront of pre Stellantis electrification in the PSA group. Meanwhile, Ram, a brand that wants to be seen first and foremost as a work vehicle brand, promised a total of five electrified models in the future, including an all-electric Ram 1500 pickup by 2024, a quote, fully electrified solution in the majority of our segments by 2025, and a fully electric portfolio by 2030. The next presentation from Fiat showed some chinks in Stellantis's promised lineup. How? Well, despite promising the brand will go fully electric in Europe, a small on-screen disclaimer said, quote, Examples from European plan do not apply to Latin America. End quote. The undertone here? That just like other automakers promising to go fully electric, that transition is not going to be entirely global. The reason? Officially, Stellantis isn't saying, but it comes down to regulation and cost, I think. 
The unspoken implication here is that many Latin American countries don't have regulatory clout in place yet to force automakers to go all electric. But then there's also the question of costs associated with doing so. Right now, even with massive gigawatt hour factories planned, I suspect automakers are shying away from making truly affordable models on a global scale because they either feel unable to make the money work or they don't want to affect their bottom line by producing electric vehicles at a loss when the average MSRP of a vehicle is far less than an average EV might be. It feels like a cop-out and I'm going to let you decide in the comments below which of those two you think it is. Jeep finished off the mainstream brand presentation for the group, acknowledging that all electric Jeeps would be able to offer more luggage capabilities and have better off-road performance thanks to their drivetrains and battery packs. By 2025, we were told, we'll see a zero emission vehicle offered by Jeep in every SUV segment, 70% of its sales will be electrified, and the brand will offer a premium zero emission vehicle lineup under the Wagoneer nameplate. This all sounds exciting, but again, the small print on screen tells a subtler and less impressive story. In this case, Jeep states, quote, electrification includes BEV, PHEV, HEV, and MHEV. That's battery electric vehicle, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, hybrid electric vehicle, and mild hybrid electric vehicle, in case you were curious. And those latter two they're honestly not really going to be capable of all-electric operation. With the brand roundups done, let's look at the four all-electric global platforms Stellantis says it will be developing. At the smallest end is Stella Small, a platform that will underpin all-electric city cars, while Stella Medium will, you've guessed it, underpin larger vehicles and what the group says will be its premium models. At the largest end will be Stella Large, a platform that will underpin all-wheel drive and performance vehicles. These three car platforms will be unibody constructions with ranges between 500 kilometers, 300 miles per charge for the Stella Small, all the way up to 800 kilometers, 500 miles for the Stella Large. For trucks and commercial vehicles, Stellantis says it will produce the Stella Frame platform, which will offer a similar range to the Stella Large platform, but be designed for truck and commercial use. As is now becoming the standard, each platform will be offered with a choice of battery pack capacities, with the small offering between 37 and 82 kilowatt hours of battery capabilities, the medium offering between 87 and 104 kilowatt hours of energy, and the others offering 101 and 118 kilowatt hours of capacity, with the frame starting with 159 kilowatt hours of capacity and going up beyond 200 kilowatt hours of capacity. On top of the battery electric platforms for Stellar Frame, Solantis promises what it says will be the REPB, that's Range Electric Paradigm Breaker. Don't ask me why the name exists, but apparently we're going to be told more about this particular vehicle platform in the future. If I had to guess, I'm going to posit that we will likely be looking at a range extended hydrogen fuel cell option for pickup trucks and delivery vehicles, but I might be wrong. To drivetrains. Like other automakers making a big push towards electric, Stellantis has designed a range of motors and controllers, but where it's interesting is the way that the modular motors Stellantis has designed, offset and coaxial in their designs for rear, front, all-wheel and hybrid drive, can be scaled from 70 kilowatts of power output to more than 330 kilowatts of power. In the same way, it says it's developed a single scalable inverter design that we can use to power the range of its plug-in models. At the entry-level end, it will use silicon-based power electronics, while silicon carbide will be used for the higher-end power electronics in vehicles that require more power capabilities. Since charging is now integrated into power electronics for motor control, Scientist also hints that 4 and 800 volt operation will be supported with its higher power vehicles, although I'd expect city cars based on Stellar Small not to have 800 volt charging at launch due to battery pack and design restrictions. Importantly though, Stellantis is working with charging station providers and says it's committed to investing in both charging networks and vehicle-to-grid capabilities worldwide to batteries. Scientis says it's opted for a dual chemistry solution that will be employed across its range. For smaller packs and lower power demands, it will use a nickel and cobalt free chemistry with graphite carbon coating on a copper anode and an iron manganese aluminium based cathode. 
It will be built in a cell to pack design, which as I'm sure you all know by now, means that the battery pack will form a structural part of the car, which will save weight and materials from today's current practice of putting cells in modules and then putting those modules within an external battery pack that's then fitted to the vehicle. It will save 20% over today's chemistries per kilowatt hour and will offer between 400 and 500 watt hours of energy per litre. At the other end, for more intensive and demanding applications, Stellantis will use a nickel-based cell design with the same graphite carbon anode, but a nickel manganese-based cathode. It will offer more energy density, 6 to 700 watt hours per litre, but it will use the more traditional module to pack design of construction. Yes, eventually solid state batteries are in the pipeline too, with Stellantis promising a solid state launch by 2026. Like other presentations we've seen this year, Stellantis includes battery recycling as part of its future, with the goal of having a fully closed loop recycling program in place as it brings its new electric models online. That recycling is not only for end of life programs, but also second life programs, which will help provide an additional revenue stream for the company using batteries that are no longer useful in a vehicle, but not ready to be fully recycled. So there you have it another major automaker making a major statement about its intentions for an all-electric future. It's clear that this presentation shows that its European brands, Fiat, Peugeot, Citroen and Opel, are likely to go all-electric well before the US brands, but with Ram and Dodge going electric and Jeep also following suit, it might be time to admit that hell is finally freezing over for the trio of brands that we frankly always expected to be the last to get a plug. After all, Dodge's Hellcat is about as far as you can get from an eco-minded car. Whatever the reasons for this transition though, I think it is worth celebrating the moment. Sure, we have to hold all of these brands to their promises and make sure they do actually follow suit, but with pretty much every major European automaker going electric and the big three from Detroit following suit, there are a diminishing number of brands worldwide that are holding out on electric. Number one of those, Toyota. And I'm not really going to hold my breath for that one anytime soon. That's it for today. Please do hit subscribe and the bell if you haven't yet, as it makes sure that you don't miss out on our videos. And please do the same to our other two channels, Transport Evolved Take Two, and if you're in a hurry, Transport Evolved Shorts. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew, go out to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month Patreon supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, Andrew Martin, Guido Drahoa, Brophy Wolf, Anonymous Freak, Ray Jean Fellows, Carl Hodgson, Gordon C, Paul Conway, Laura Sanborn, Anthony Coates, Denny Hyde, Sean Ueda, and Tazla in the Gong, and our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters, John Lyons, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, and Ian. If you'd like to join the ranks of wonderful supporters, you'll find links below to Patreon, Bitcoin and Ko-fi. You can chat with the team and TE fans over at Discord. And don't forget that we are getting very close to our 1000th Patreon supporter. And if you are that lucky person, we have some plans for you. Thanks for joining me. And as always, keep evolving.